Hi, my name is Ursula Ratz-Spivak. I'm an applied mathematician and I work in the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics in Cambridge. I want to talk to you today about the maths of imaging, but also give you some idea of what it's like to do applied mathematics and an overview of the kind of applications to real world problems that can be done using the maths of imaging. I will start as any mathematician should by defining what I'm going to talk about. So what I, do I mean by imaging? I will define imaging as reproducing the form of an object from indirect measurements. And by form, I mean any property of an object, its shape, its density, or any other property. And I will define later what I mean by indirect measurements. Some examples of this are medical imaging, of which you may already know something, you may have had some direct experience, but also detecting buried mines, um, radar remote sensing, radar and sonar are all examples of imaging. And also this slightly different example of deblurring a fuzzy photo. Now, what is this? This is the process of removing from an image some noise or distortion, any artifacts that may be caused by, for example, um, a shaky camera, and then retrieve the original, restore the original sharp image. How is this done? Well, in the case of medical imaging, and here you see ultrasound or CT scan, what we do is we shine some radiation inside the body, and the radiation will be ultrasound or X-rays in these two cases. Then inside the body, the radiation is scattered or, or bent, diffracted, and some radiation will then come out again, and this the scattered radiation is measured at the surface with some sensors. Then the shape of the body's interior is reconstructed using an appropriate mathematical model. Of course, this model will need to be based on, will need to describe how the waves propagate and are scattered by the body. So we'll need to be based on wave equations. These are differential equations normally. Um, you may have seen, if you've done springs in school, you may have seen a simple kind of a wave equation. And the case of detecting buried mines. The process is again very similar. Again, we send a radiation inside the ground and the radiation will be uh, microwaves if it's ground penetrating radar or infrared light if it's done with thermographic imaging. The radiation then is scattered inside the earth or, or bent. Some of course will be lost, but some will be scattered back and can be measured at the surface. And from this measured scattered radiation and the mathematical model based on the wave equation, we can retrieve the shape of objects underneath the surface. Another example, so radar, radar remote sensing um, is done again in a very similar way. Here the radiation is sent from an antenna on a plane, a plane that flies over the part of the um, surface, the Earth's surface that we want to examine. The Earth's surface will scatter back this radiation. Of course, it will be scattered in all directions, but some of it will get back to the plane where a receiving antenna can measure the scattered radiation that he has received. From these measurements, and again, the mathematical model based on the wave equation, we can retrieve properties of the Earth's surface. The last example, um, deblurring an image. So yes, this is a bit different. Here you see in the picture a blurred photo on top left and the reconstructed original photo un underneath. What does it mean mathematically to blur a photo? Well, uh, mathematically, a photo is stored as a kind of, of table, a matrix, where for each pixel we have 
the value of the intensity and light and the intensity and color of the light at that particular point. Blurring this means to sort of spread out, distort these values at each pixel. And this is done with a blurring function, PSF or point spread function that somehow spreads out and distorts the value of those points. Now, if we have a blurred image H, then this is the product of the blurring function times the original image. This is a special kind of pro product called a convolution. If we want to retrieve the original image, we'll have to do the process in reverse. And this is called the deconvolution. Of course, in order to do that, we, know, we need to know what that blurring function is. And actually, uh, usually we don't know exactly what it is, but we have enough information so that we can make a good approximation, a good guess of what this blurring function should look like. The one I've um, put there in the picture is called the Gaussian, this hat shape function. And actually that is a very good approximation for all sorts of uh, real uh, cases where we have a blurred image. If you want to have a look at the maths behind the blurring, you should look at the, the article I put there, the link. It's an article by Chris Budd in Plus magazine um, called Crime Fighting Maths. Go and have a look at it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fantastic read. It'll give you the mathematical explanation. Okay, so now I've given you quite a few examples of the applications of mathematical imaging. And already you've seen that maths here is used to save lives by helping doctors make diagnoses, by predicting earthquakes. In the case of radar, actually that picture showed a plane with, um, um, that was detecting earthquake faults in the earth. Other ways that radar is used is, for example, tracking pollution on, on the surface of the sea or tracking um, monitoring climate change by tracking the um, biomass dense density of forests. And of course, detecting buried mines <laughs> does save millions of lives, but also maths used to make the world a better place. So when we monitor climate change or by fighting crimes. Okay, let's look at the maths then. I would say that imaging problems in general are inverse problems. So we want to define it as reproducing the form of an image object from indirect measurements. So here I would define the direct problem, for example, in the case of the various examples we saw, as having some source of radiation. So an incident field, I called it phi here, we shine it onto a known object and using a mathematical model, we can calculate the scattered field. The inverse problem is when we know the incident field. So again, all the properties, the intensity, the angle, we measure the scattered field. And from these measurements, we want to retrieve what was the object that produced that scattered field. So any properties of that object its shape, well, where it was as well, or other properties like density and so on. Well, this is a much more difficult problem. Inverse problems actually have a very long history. The example I um, illustrated here is an allegory called Plato's Cave. Now, Plato was um, a philosopher, a Greek philosopher who lived about 500 years before the Christian era, so quite a long time ago. In this allegory, we have prisoners chained underground in a cave. They've been chained there since a, a very, very young age, so they don't have any knowledge of the outside world. But the only knowledge they can get is by watching the shadows projected onto the wall from objects that some people bring underground from the outside and parade in front of a fire. As you can imagine, 
it's not so easy to tell what the object looks like just by looking at the shadow. Well, an object might cast different shadows depending on how we hold it or how we rotate it. And actually, two different objects might cast exactly the same shadow. Now, Plato didn't use this allegory to illustrate some maths problem. He was interested in uh, issues in social sciences and in politics. And this was an example just to illustrate something to do with our perception of the world. But it is a very good example of an inverse problem. It is indeed an inverse problem. And it's very uh, tricky. Yes, all inverse problems are tricky. This particular cartoon illustrates the, the example of knowing an object from a shadow. It's a cartoon actually from a journal in neuroscience and was used to illustrate how tricky it is to know something about the brain from all the indirect measurements we have. But illustrates very well what happens in general with any inverse problems. Now we want to do maths and particularly we want to know how we can use maths to ensure that the solutions are actually as accurate as possible. In order to do that the first thing we should do as mathematicians is to put things in an abstract way. This makes the problem much easier to, to tackle and also it makes it easier to make it rigorous. So in the case of the indirect, um, the inverse problem with the shadows, the direct problem was we shine, shine some light onto an object and we can calculate what the shadow was. The inverse problem is we can see the shadow produced by the object when it was illuminated with, it, with some light and we want to find what the object was. And in the case of the various examples with involving radiation, the direct problem was we have a known incident field onto an object. We can calculate the scattered field. The inverse problem was we have the scattered field. We measure it. We know what the incident field was. We want to find what the object was that caused it. So let's give abstract name to things. We shall call X the object. We shall denote by big A how the incident field acts on A. So this is our process. It's the mathematical model we used. And we shall call the scattered field Y. Using these abstract names, then we can actually write our problem very simply. <laughs> it's a de deceptively simple formulation. We can just write it as AX equals Y. And be careful here, AX doesn't mean A times X. It means A applied to X, like a function of X, for example. And then the direct problem is given X and A, find Y. The inverse problem is given Y and A, find X. Now, we can go and look mathematically at things. So with this abstract formulation, AX equals Y, we shall call A is what we would call an operator. So for example, a function, but in general, just a mapping that takes an object X from a set big X and maps it onto an object Y in a set Y, as illustrated there in that uh, schematic picture. Right, so let's look at some examples. An example of a direct problem, very simple example, x plus three equals y. So here the operator A is add three. And what's the inverse of this? Well, the inverse of adding something is subtracting something. So the inverse is x equals y minus 3, and our inverse operator is subtract 3. And we shall denote the inverse operator by a to the minus 1, the inverse of a. Some other examples, a little bit more complicated, but uh, you've probably seen this. We can take integration as the 
direct problem. So if we have a function f of z and an operator, which is integration with respect to z, then our direct problem is take the integral of f of z, find g of z. And what is the inverse of this? You probably know what's the inverse of integrating. Yes, the inverse of taking the integral of a function is taking the derivative. So f of z equals the derivative with respect to z of g. Our inverse operator a to the minus one is take the derivative with respect to z. And there can be many more examples and you can think of some. Before I go deeper into the maths of inverse problems and also to, to look at things that may go wrong, issues that can occur, I want to give you the definition of well-posed and ill-posed problems. This was defined by Jacques Hadamard in the second half of 1800, roughly, and he defined a mathematical problem as well-posed if it had these three properties. So a problem is well-posed if a solution exist, if that solution is unique, so there's just the one, and if the solution changes continuously with the initial data. What does that mean? Well, roughly it means that if I change the initial data just a little bit, I make a small change in the initial data, then the solution should also have just a small change. Well, at the time, many mathematicians thought that if a problem didn't have those nice properties, so a solution which they thought it was unique and had was a good solution, then they thought it wasn't really worth looking at, with at least not with rigorous maths, not worth of mathematical consideration. So a sensible problem a well-posed problem would have been something like, given the shape of an object, how does it vibrate? Well, if we're given an object and its property and uh, its geometry, we can calculate the modes of vibration mathematically. This is a well-posed problem. Another well-posed problem, as we've seen before, given an incident field and an object, what is the scattered field? But improper, problems, so ill-posed problems would have been something like, can we hear the shape of a drum? As was formulated famously, that is, if we hear a sound, can we tell what the geometry of the object that produced it was? What was the object? Or given the incident field and a measure scattered field, can we calculate what the object was? And quite a few mathematicians at the time thought that it, this was not worth answering with rigorous maths. Really? Well, most problems in the real world are ill-posed. And we do want to find solutions to them. But in fact, maths itself came to the rescue and rigorous maths. Moore and Penrose addressed the issue of existence and uniqueness of a solution. So properties one and two that we saw just now. And Tikhonov addressed the issue of instability with respect to the initial data. So the third property we saw, when the solution doesn't change continuously with the initial data. Okay, so let's get back to look at our simple abstract formulation for an inverse problem. And let's see what might go wrong. So let's take, first of all, the, the very simple first example we looked at, where the direct problem was x plus three equals y. So we shall take here as the set x, the set of all natural numbers, so uh, positive integers, and uh, the set y also, the set of all natural numbers. Well, what can go wrong when we do the inverse operation here? Well, what happens if y is equal to two? Yeah, things can go wrong. 
And another example. Now, as the operator A, we shall take, take the, the square. So our direct problem is x squared equals y. And we shall take as x the set of real numbers. Then y will be the set of real positive numbers. Well, that's because if we take the square of something, we always get a positive number. And what can go wrong here? Well, if we do the inverse, and our y, for example, is 4, well, how can we tell what produced 4 by taking the square? Both 2 and minus 2 are possible solutions. So here we've seen an example of non-existence and an example of non-uniqueness. The third property, the continuity with respect to initial data, that is a little more complicated, sort of not as intuitive to look at. But um, I want to illustrate it. I want to start from a simple example that you've probably seen in school, just a system of linear algebraic equations. So let's consider ax1 plus bx2 equals y1 and cx1 plus dx2 equals y2. Now, a, b, c, and d are just fixed parameters. And the direct problem is given x1 and x2, find y1 and y2. In order to illustrate what happens with the inverse problem here, so given y1 and y2, find x1 and x2, I want to formulate this in a slightly different uh, form. So I shall define two vectors x and y, where x has element x1 and x2, and y has elements y1 and y2. If I do that, then I can rewrite this system of algebraic equations as a matrix equation. You may have seen matrices in school already, or you probably will soon. So the matrix is that object there with elements a, b, c, and d. And when multiplied by the vector x, it gives the vector y. And I can write this simply, like our simple abstract form that we saw before, as ax equals y, if I call that matrix A. Now, the solution of the inverse problem, so given y find x, is x equals that formula. You may not have seen that in school, but you can actually check if you know how to do matrix multiplication that that formula is correct. So x is equal to 1 divided by ad minus bc, and that is the difference of the two diagonals of that matrix there, ad minus bc, and that is actually called the determinant of that matrix. So that fraction times a slightly different matrix that is actually called the transpose of the original matrix A times Y. And we shall write this as X equals A to the minus one Y, because we've done the inverse of the previous operation. What can go wrong here? Well, what happens if AD is equal to BC? So if the determinant of that matrix is zero, well, if that is zero, the solution sort of blows up. That matrix, uh, that uh, fraction goes to infinity. So our solution does not exist. But it turns out that we can have problems even when that is not equal to zero but when it's actually sort of very small. We'll see this in an example. In order to see, I want to look at a slightly different matrix. So not A, B, C, D like before, but that matrix with elements A, A, C, C plus Epsilon. It's a slightly contrived example, but I think it actually illustrates very well what happens with inverse problems when that third property is not obeyed. So if we have 
that matrix, the solution to the inverse problem is x equals, and I use the same formula as before, the fraction now is 1 divided a times epsilon, if you take the difference of the two diagonals there, times the transpose times y. Now, if a is a very small parameter, then our solution x is multiplied by a bigger and bigger fa factor as epsilon gets smaller. So 1 over a times epsilon gets bigger and bigger as epsilon gets smaller. So what happens if we have a very small error in our initial data, the vector y, then this small error will be wildly amplified in the solution. Non-continuity with respect to initial data. We can actually sort of fix this. Look, look at what happens here. I've just added a fixed number, a fixed small number to that element in the matrix that gave us the problems. So instead of C plus epsilon, here I have C plus epsilon plus 0.1. So what does the solution look like? The fraction is not 1 over a times epsilon now, but is 1 divided by a times epsilon plus 0.1. So it doesn't matter how small epsilon becomes, even if it's nearly zero, that fraction will not go to infinity. Actually, it will stay bounded by 1 divided by a times 0.1. So adding that parameter makes the solution stable. Now, of course, I've added something extraneous and I will never get back to the correct, exact solution, but I've made the solution stable. I've made my operations reliable. And of course, I will need rigorous maths to tell us uh, what sort of error I've introduced in the solution. This particular example is contrived, but is very close to what is done with rigorous maths in order to stabilize inverse problems, and in particular to the um, Tikhonov regularization that is very often used by mathematicians. Now, what happens when we solve inverse problems in, in practice, as applied mathematicians or as physicists, we have a real problem and we need to solve it. There are some interesting issues that arise. And before I explain those, I want to tell you a joke. Um, OK, here it goes. We have a physics professor and a maths professor. The physics professor has been doing an experiment and has worked out an empirical equation that seems to explain his data. But he wants to be sure that it's a proper uh, equation that is sensible. So he goes and asks the maths professor to look at it. So she goes away and does that. A week later, the maths professor says that the equation is invalid. But by then, the physics professor has used the equation to predict the results of further experiments and is getting excellent results. Everything works out and matches. So he asked the math professor to look again. Another week goes by, they meet once more. The math professor tells the physics professor that the equation does work, but only in the trivial case where the numbers are real and positive. Well, in practice, in the real world, as I'm sure you know, there are lots of variables, lots of quantities that are always real and positive. Think of energy, for example. So when we actually solve inverse problems in practice, sometimes things work out, even if the math doesn't always work out, because the real world is a special case. There are actually instances in which things work out because of the nature of practical calculations. And we'll see that in a minute. Oh, of course, there are cases where things just go wrong and we need to fix them. In all cases, we need rigorous maths. Well, first of all, to tell us that the equations we use have good solutions. 
also to tell us why and how some practical calculations work out when the maths tell us, tells us that they shouldn't. Or we need maths to put things right in a predictable, quantifiable, so reliable way. Okay, so the case where things go work out because of the nature of practical calculations. Well, practical calculations are usually approximations. We don't have um, exact formulae for the solution of many complicated equations often. So we need to make approximations and we need to use computers. Now, when we input things in a computer, variables that take continuous values must be discretized. What do I mean by this? Um, the example here is just a general, a generic function. That one is kind of combinations of sines and cosines. This is a function f of x, and the variable x takes continuous values in some interval. Here is an interval not to don't know, five and a half, something like that. If x takes continuous values in that interval, it means it can take any real value can take any real value in that interval so that is an infinite number of values and the corresponding values of the function f of x are also infinite values we cannot input an infinite number of values into a computer we need to input a subset a sample of these for example we can only input we will input only the subset that i've indicated there by those red dots what happens? It turns out that discretization is actually a type of regularization. Uh, so I won't explain here, it's something you won't see even in your first year at university. It's a bit complicated, but it's quite fascinating. It, it depends on the fact that actually discretizing something, it's a sort of projection from a multidimensional space onto a space which has lower dimension. And that discretizes, regularizes um, the solution, the problem we are looking at. Other cases where things work out in practice, because practical calculations are approximations, are the case that involve an infinite series or, or sequences. We often, as applied mathematicians have to use expression that involve infinite series or sequences. And again, we can't input all the infinite values and we may not have an expression for the sum of that series, for example. So we must truncate things, only take a finite number of terms in the series or in the sequence. If the series or sequence converge, it doesn't matter. If we take just a finite number of values, we know that it's a fairly good approximation. And if we take more terms, it'll be a better approximation. But we're in trouble if that series or that sequence does not converge, because then it doesn't make much sense to just take a finite number of values. Well, even when using a series that does not converge, very often the first few terms provide a good approximation. And uh, applied mathematicians and physicists used series or sequences that don't converge the whole time. Just, just go and look up Born approximation. Everybody uses it. They use just a few terms. They almost invariably use it in cases where it does not converge. Well, why am I talking to you about infinite uh, series or sequences? It turns out that infinite non-convergent sequences are relevant to inverse problems. Why? To show you this, I will introduce another definition. I will introduce the concept of fixed point equation. So we define a fixed point of an equation in this way, given f of x, a fixed point is a point x such that f of x is equal to x. 
So that is our fixed point equation, f of x equals x. And the fixed point x is one that satisfies it. It might look a bit strange, maybe not very intuitive, but there are quite simple examples of this. Think of sine x equals x. Well, I bet you've already found the fixed point of that equation. What about x equals zero? Yep. Sine of zero is zero. Not all fixed point equations are as easy as that. Just think of cos x equals x. Actually, don't think about it now. Think about it later. It's not as simple at all. But it turns out that fixed point equations can be solved by using iterations. What do I mean by that? I mean that we can make some initial guess. I'll call it x naught. Then we can apply our function to this again and again, iteratively, as follows. So our x1 will be equal to f of x naught, x2 equal to f of x1, and so on. Of course, by doing this, we hope that at some point after n iterations, x n plus 1 will be roughly equal to f of x n. If we reach that, it means that we have more or less the fixed point, a very good approximation to the fixed point. It also means that our sequence x n, and I've denoted it there by the curly brackets, our sequence x n tends to the fixed point x as n tends to infinity. Now, if that happens, that's great. Of course, it doesn't always happen. Let's see some examples. So examples where we can, we try to solve a fixed point equation iteratively. Let's take our function f of x here as that simple expression, ax minus bx squared. Well, a and b are just some fixed parameter. Here we put uh, a equals 2.5 and b equals 1.5. So x is equal to 2.5 times x minus 1.5 times x squared. And we start trying to solve it iteratively. We make an initial guess. Here I've put uh, x naught equals 0 0.01. And then we start iterate. x1 is equal to f of 0 0.01, and I've calculated it there. You can check if you want. It's boring. I think all the numbers here are right. Let's see what happens. As we start to iterate x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on, we get closer to the fixed point. Well, the fixed point of that equation is x equals 1. But you can see it quite easily. So we start to get close to x equals 1. x5 is 0.67. x6 is 1.01. It's actually a bit bigger than 1. But then x7 is a little less. And look what happens. x8 is again a bit bigger, but not quite as big as x6. And x9 is a bit smaller, but not that far from 1 as x7 was. So what we are doing here is oscillating above and below the fixed point x equals 1. But each time, at each iteration, the difference gets smaller. So actually, this sequence does tend to the fixed point x equals 1. Let's see another example. Same um, expression, but with different parameters. So our a here is the fraction 13 divided by 4, and our b is the fraction 3 divided by 2. This fixed point equation has a solution x equals 3 over 2, so 1.5. Let's make, again, the same initial guess, x0 equals 0 0.01, and let's see what happens. It looks quite promising at first. We start getting iterates that get closer to 1.5. So x4 is 0 0.88, and then x5 is a bit more 
than 1.5, but at six is a bit less. It looks as if the similar thing happens as before. We oscillate above and below. So we hope that this is also a convergent sequence. Let's try some more iterates. X7 is 1.74. So actually, it is bigger than 1.5, but bigger than our iterate X5. And X8 is below, but is further below than X6 was. It doesn't look good. So what happens here is when we iterate, again, we oscillate above and below, but instead of getting smaller and smaller differences, we get further and further away from the fixed point. So this iteration doesn't converge to the fixed point. Actually, if we had used pure maths, instead of just plugging the calculations into a computer, we would have known from the start that the previous example converged and this one doesn't. Because with rigorous maths, we can tell the properties that our function f needs to have in order for an iterative process like this to converge. Fascinating stuff, not enough time to see that here and not that easy to see either. But why are fixed point equations relevant to inverse problems? Remember, our inverse problem could be expressed abstractly as ax equals y with solution x equals a to the minus one, the inverse of a times y. Well, we can actually write ax equals y as a fixed point equation. It's quite simple to do. Let's take ax equals y and add x either side of the equal sign. You can do that, perfectly legitimate. ax plus x equals y plus x. Then we can rearrange this and write x equals x plus y minus ax. And this is a function of x. x plus y minus ax is a function f of x. So we have a fixed point equation and we can solve it iteratively. That's very good news, actually, because you see, if we use this iterative solution, this is much more efficient on a computer because we only have the operator a there. We don't need to calculate a to the minus one. And in, in real uh, problems, the operator a, when we deal with it, will be a big matrix that we input in a computer. And by big, I mean big, not just the big bigger than the two plus two um, times two matrix that we saw. We can have a thousand by a thousand, or even in three dimension, 10,000 by 10,000 by 10,000 and so on. Very, very big matrices. And inverting a matrix as big as that is just impossible to do on a computer. It's not just impossible because the computer is not fast enough, and certainly even some modern computers wouldn't be fast enough. But the main problem is the memory storage. They, uh, computers would just not be able to deal with such a big problem, would just get stuck. So if we can avoid calculating the inverse is much better. It, it would also be more stable because remember, the problems we saw when we inverted the matrix, there are big problems of instability that can occur. Yes, beware, of course, as we've just seen, typically iterations may not converge to the exact solutions. In fact, I've illustrated it here with the real examples on the horizontal axis, you'll see the number of iterations um, to find a solution to an inverse problem, so where we started from that value x naught there as a guess for the solution. Here I knew what the exact solution was, so I put there with that red horizontal line, that is the exact value. So as you can see, as, as we start iterating, one, two, three, five iterations, we get closer to the exact solutions, but then at some point we start moving away. 
and the solution gets worse and worse. And this is something that uh, usually happens in uh, real cases solving inverse problems. It's a phenomenon called uh, semi-convergence. We will not go into more of this here, but I hope you started being interested in these things. And if you are, I've put here some resources where you can go deeper into the maths and the applications of many of the things mentioned here. So go and have a look and enjoy. Bye.